Last week I um, read for the stinked time uh, Lao Tzu's Del Peking. And this small work, which is perhaps the greatest text on the mystical experience that we have, struck me forcibly in the light of the experiences that are taking place in the American psychology at this moment. In the last two or three weeks, the spirit of alarmism has been abroad in our land, and the pronouncements of the new administration have, I fear, not accomplished the purpose for which they were intended. Uh, statements that were intended to wake people up to certain emergencies, certain definite situations, have instead simply overwhelmed many individuals. Instead of stimulation, we find a certain negative despairism rising in the face of a call to clear thinking. This, I feel, has a bearing upon what we term mysticism. For if the mystical experience means anything in the life of the individual, it means the recognition or discovery of certainties at the root of life. Certainties that are stronger uh, than any situation that can arise in human society. The strength for right action arises from right conviction. And without this conviction, almost any effort that we make fails from lack of courage, lack of inner integration. The person cannot actually orient himself in the world in which he lives unless he has some basic internal orientation about value. We have thought of the mystical experience as essentially a religious experience. But as we read Lao Tse again, we note that practically every verse of his little book is a direct application of inner light to daily problem. He is not willing to permit his reader to drift off into some sphere of metaphysical speculation. He is not willing to allow the person to have this mystical experience without using it, without putting it to work immediately as a sovereign remedy against the ills of the time in which he lives. Now all attitudes that we have, whether mystical or otherwise, are strongly rooted in the nature and structure of mind itself. And Lao Tse and most other mystics have recognized two essential levels or qualities of mental activity. One of these the metaphysician has called divine mind. Divine mind is abstractly the mind of God. It is the creative mind, the basic universal intelligence by means of which all processes in the unfoldment of the universe are directed toward the end which has always rested in the divine purpose. Uh, thus, the idealist differing from the materialist, has assumed that there is a reason at the root of things, a purpose, 
a divine concept, a realization of value, and that the universal procedure arises from a universal wisdom. The mystic also assumes that because this universal wisdom is rooted in deity itself, or is rooted in an essential substance of its own kind, that this wisdom is not only always present, but is always sufficient. Man in his own uncertainty is inclined to assume the uncertainty of the world in which he lives. When man is troubled, he may go so far as to suspect that God is troubled. When man's affairs go badly, it is apparent to the uninformed that deity has lost control of the situation. Now, there may be some doubt, however, as to this type of negative conjecturing. Whatever this divine mind may be, uh, astronomy alone can give us, if not an understanding, at least a broad evidence as to the power of this mind. This mind not only sustains planets, and solar systems, but universes and universal systems, so vast, so inconceivable, that our entire solar system is not more than a speck of dust floating in some larger organic structure. We do not count the creativity of universal mind in terms of world alone but in term of infinites, infinites that transcend even our most abstract creative thinking. We must recognize that this mind rests in a space that goes on forever. For if this space comes to some conceivable termination, then some other space takes over. And in this other space, the divine mind is also present. Thus we live and move and have our being in the substance of an infinite and eternal purpose. This purpose is larger, more inclusive, and more purposeful than anything we can conceive. It is therefore up to us to recognize that in the working of this infinite principle, manifesting as it does through an infinite diversity of reasonable processes, that we actually live in a very well-ordered creation that the disorder in creation as we sense it or as it seems to move in upon us is little more than the delinquency of a small group of minds now this delinquency has however the urgency of nearness the universal mind is everywhere the delinquent mind is somewhere and that somewhere at the moment is right here now this means uh, much as the ancients pointed out, uh, that the sun is far stronger than the moon, but the moon is nearer, that the power of light is far greater than the power of darkness, but due to the structure of the earth, part of the earth is in darkness at all times, and yet it, is, it exists in an infinite field of light. Consequently, we have to assume that this dilemma arises not as a cosmic tragedy, but as something peculiarly associated with ways of life, with ways of thinking on a small globe, 
somewhere in the midst of an infinite integrity. Now we are also pondered with another question. Just how large is the area of delinquency? Is our planet the only backward one in space? Are we really a sort of cosmic trash can into which all trouble has dropped? Is it possible that other planets also have their problems? I imagine that we can say that wherever a world exists in space, in which an evolving creation is attempting to unfold its potential, wherever this exists, there will be problems problem of adjustment between the unfolding of life and the pressure of circumstance. Man in his attempt to grow has grown so awkwardly that it is inevitable that the very growing itself produces its own pain. And against this pain the individual has no complete protection, but he does have the possibility of adequate insight by means of which a great deal of the pain is removed. Now lack of insight is also a mental phenomenon and for the most part it is due to man's inadequate comprehension of values in terms of importances. We have become so completely obsessed <coughs> with the significance of the small world in which we live, the vital and immediate danger of the situations that we have caused, that it becomes difficult for us to keep perspective. We just think the wrong way about the right things. Uh, we do not think through, we do not think reasonably. An example of this, of course, has been the moral and ethical disintegration of society during the opening years of this atomic age in which we live. We are now in a neurosis over the danger that hangs over our world. What would you say if science should come out tomorrow and would announce that something has been discovered infinitely more destructive than the atomic bomb. What would you say if it is now a scientific certainty that there is a killer far more deadly and far more universal than atomic bombs can ever be, and that that killer is already at work in this world and within the next hundred years will claim five billion lives. Well, that might cause a moment's uh, thought and a minute of panic. But this terrible killer, which we seldom if ever give much attention to, is the normal death rate. so normal that we take it for granted and hardly give it a negative thought. Therefore we discover that we are afraid mostly of the exceptional things, things that we are not accustomed to. Yet even in these exceptional things our mental attitudes have much to do with the reactions that we have. At this time, the rate of, we might say, preventable accidents, accidents due to carelessness, accidents due to psychotics, at wheels of powerful automobiles, this accident rate is far in excess of the damage caused by the bombs of Hiroshige and Nagasaki. We have these to face, yet we give them very little thought. Why? 
because our minds have not been trained to worry in that direction. And our minds worry according to what we instruct them to worry about. Our worry, therefore, is a very personal situation. And in the problem of mind today, we are faced with a, a condition of untrained mentation in which the mind becomes simply an instrument uh, to defend and rationalize fear. Actually, the human mind has never really dominated the life of the average person. Actually, we are dominated by emotional pressure, and it becomes the moral duty of the mind to support the fear of the emotions, to prove that the worst that we fear is true, is left to the intellectual equipment. While this continues, we are bound to pass from one condition of uncertainty or anxiety to another. We have no basic remedy against basic fear. The mystical experience, according to Lao Tzu, is aimed at this. It is not a problem of the benevolent or beautiful effects of being picked up into the cosmos and being given a certain interior vision of the divine presence. The real value of the emotional or mystical experience is that man shall conquer fear, that he shall so become aware of the eternal presence of good, that his faith factors will be so intensely stimulated that he is no longer a victim of negative apprehension. Now, the mind of man is capable of these processes also. And among the constructive aspects of mentation can be the rationalization of faith. And the perhaps the second power of the mind is the formulation of policy by means of that, by means of which that which is mentally desirable necessary or urgently needed can be accomplished. So the mind establishes values and solves problems if we will permit it to have these functions. The mind of man becomes like the mind of the universe or the divine mind when it operates according uh, to vision, insight, value, and solution. Thus the mind is lifted up from its normal, rather uncertain occupations to a recognition that it is possible for mind as an instrument in man to fight for man rather than against him and that the mind with which we now develop some amazing faculties of criticism uh, can also be the origin of faculties of coordination, of recognitions of values. We look around us at the principal problems of the world, and we see that these problems stem largely from wrong thinking from selfish thinking, from false indoctrination, from prejudice and intolerance, powers that arise in the wrong or negative aspect of our faculties. Now, nature does not wish faculties to be used in this way. Nature has no patience, we may say, with the mind which is forever negating its own purpose. Therefore, in order that man shall never be without 
a certain instruction in this. The universal procedure sets up a process of rewards and penalties, rewards and punishments. And these come under the oriental doctrine of karma. The individual is not permitted by nature to use any faculty wrongly without being strongly reminded that he's making a mistake. He is not allowed to drift along with false attitudes without some instruction being bestowed. And nature and its own mind has so cunningly devised this entire panorama of existence that the negative consequences of thought and action are inherent in the processes themselves so that wrong thinking penalizes the individual. It punishes him by its own reaction upon his life. Any form of mental or emotional energy which is misused will produce trouble for the person who misuses it. And on a large collective level, collective mental and emotional errors will produce collective disaster. Thus nature is telling us, as clearly as possible, that mistakes are probably inevitable, but that we are here to learn from them, not to continue to make them. Now, in order to get this feeling deeply seated in ourselves, we have to establish some positive principles. We have to think from certain beliefs which we regard as intrinsically true. And we also gain a certain measure of support. Perhaps the first thing that we have to have is faith, which is a firm belief in the reality of something unseen or of something not immediately to be analyzed by faculties. But the reward of these positive acceptances is that they soon reveal the fact of themselves. Faith proves itself to be a fact. It is not known to be a fact in the beginning, but out of its very workings, its factual importance is established. This is perfectly proper to man, for what we have overlooked is that man at any particular stage of his growth is unable to establish factually the principles upon which his own progress depends. A person at a certain stage in his development can only factually grasp that which is already within his understanding. That which he must aspire to, that to which his understanding must ascend by further growth, he is unable at any time to factualize. Yet the urgency of the need for this growth cannot be denied, and the consequence of growth reveals its factual content. Ultimately, we also realize that man cannot know all things until the end of his journey, wherever that journey may lead him. Consequently, man must always live in the presence of a degree of understanding and a degree of lack of understanding. That part which is understood must be positively interpreted. That part which is not understood must be positively conceived in terms of faith, principle, or trust in universal integrity. So we may say that the mystical experience arises from a certain contemplation of values, a certain recognition 
First of all, that this universe is a regulated structure. And in the second place, that the purpose of universal existence is not destruction. If we assume this to be destruction, we then destroy the dignity of deity and of basic principle. It is futile for the individual to contemplate a futile existence. It is useless to assume that this process through which we are passing is going nowhere. To take such an assumption is to destroy self. And wherever we find individuals who remove, according to their own concept, the basic dignities of existence from their philosophy of life, these peoples are impoverished. They live on a lower level of integration. They are more vulnerable to dangers. They are more commonly sick in soul and body. So we come to this concept that the mind, when it functions normally and properly, is a source of strength. The mind, when it functions abnormally and improper, improperly, is a source of weakness. Thus, that which contributes to weakness cannot be right. And that which contributes to essential strength, as justified by its effect upon conduct, must be a more nearly right state of affairs, even though man may not be able to estimate absolute right. Today, therefore, negative thinking is producing its obvious harvest, and that harvest is disaster. It is weakening the individual, it is weakening national purposes, it is weakening ideals and convictions about the dignity of man, it is giving consolation to the adversaries of integrity, and it makes the individual, as one said the other day, just plumb miserable. And out of such a situation, we cannot expect anything of permanent good to arise. Thus, we do face a very critical time. But wherever a problem arises in our environment, this problem is an invitation to an immediate unfoldment of internal resource. When the individual is physically under unusual stress, nature provides him with additional resource in the form of adrenaline to carry him over the emergency physically. Man in various emotional and psychic quandaries also has available internally not only physical secretions suitable to assist the more rapid function of the nervous and glandular system to support a sense of well-being or optimism in the nature, but he has available untouched subjective resources which would remain unnoticed and perhaps unused unless emergency forced them into manifestation. Thus emergency becomes one of the positive means of growth. Emergency forces man to take a straight, firm step in a necessary direction. If he is unable to take this step, he then fails the emergency. But this failure is not due to the fact that nature has not provided him with a means of success. It simply means that the individual has not made adequate use of the powers, facilities, and faculties with which he has been endowed. As we face a crisis, therefore, we realize we also face the most positive invitation to progress that nature can possibly offer. We may recognize these things intellectually, 
an intellectual recognition of them with some persons is a powerful argument. To some individuals, acceptance by the mind is the basis of a positive conviction. But for most people, acceptance by the mind is insufficient. The mind cannot sufficiently vitalize an acceptance to make it a source of immediate energy. The mind does not energize its convictions sufficiently to make them leaders of conduct. Thus Lao Tse points out that behind uh, the constructive person, behind the individual who is able to face life adequately, there has to be a kind of alchemy of internal processes that the world is first saved within the self, that the values which we are continually seeking are first discovered internally, and from this internal discovery we gain the knack of seeing them elsewhere. If, therefore, the individual is positively integrated, he is given new faculties of discernment, activity in life around him. Whereas, if he does not have this stronger light inside, the darkness on the outside appears increasingly menacing. How then shall we approach this in terms of the use of mysticism in the daily life of the person? Now, what we call a grand emergency, a national emergency, is merely a well-publicized private problem. The emergencies which we face internationally are the long shadows, the collective manifestations of continuing private emergency. All emergency is essentially private emergency. Every problem that we see around us is a symbolic exaggeration of some common fault of human nature, some weakness uh, which exists in every level of society, but is particularly obvious when it reaches the press as an international crisis. To meet these general emergencies uh, with a greater amount of insight, we have to have the mind thinking from a different kind of premise from that with which it is most commonly concerned. Mindfulness has been applied to a process by which the individual censors his own thinking. And what probably one of the important disciplines uh, that the American people must sometime give more attention to is this process of censoring oneself. Not to wait until the emergency becomes a common nuisance in society, but to apply a certain mental power to the analysis of mental procedure. The mind of man is so equipped and so constructed that it can think about other things, but it can also think about itself. The mind of man can analyze its own processes. This is not especially easy, nor is the mind much addicted to this, because it represents a measure of hard work. Also, this process of censorship means that the mind must no longer be in intimate partnership with impulse. Actually, the mind is largely the victim of emotional procedures. And just as most of the world's villains have blamed their troubles on someone else, so the mind, when cornered, and its mistakes 
clearly revealed, takes refuge under the evasion that it is merely an instrument of emotional pressure. That if the individual would feel better, he would think better. The uh, other attitude, of course, is that if he thought better, he would feel better. Now, which is the basic one? Which comes first in this case, the hen or the egg? And I think the answer lies definitely in the fact that the feeling comes first. We like to assume, of course, that everything that we do is from a high level of rationality, but we have never been able to prove it, especially afterwards. Actually, most of our manifestations are based upon impulse. We feel a certain way. Someone irritates us. So we become irritable. And having become irritable and not considering it a particularly commendable emotion, even while we're enjoying it, uh, we begin to look for a good excuse. And in order to have a good excuse, we must find a real cause for irritation. Something must have been done to us, something must have been said to us, something must have occurred to us, which justifies irritation. So the moment we begin to struggle to find out how we can prove that irritation is constructive, the only answer is we have to drag the mind in. We have to set the mind to the process of proving that the emotion is correct. If it is not a good emotion, at least it is a reasonable one. It is one for which we can develop certain defenses. And we are much more interested in defending emotions than we are in correcting them. As it goes along, therefore, we actually move almost completely from feeling. Whatever we feel like, we do. When we are nervous, we react nervously. When we are interrupted, we are annoyed. When we want it nice and quiet and someone makes a noise, we find ground for objection. And in the course of living, we gradually develop a technique by which we find something wrong with everything and everyone except ourselves. And we are assuming, of course, that others are including us in their list of difficulties. All through this procedure, feeling is dictated. You take an individual and you say, why are you emotionally upset? There are two kinds of answers, one given by the emotions themselves and the others by the mind who now comes along as the interpreter, official spokesman and press agent for the emotions. If the emotions themselves answer the question, why do I feel as I do, the emotions will simply be forced to say, I don't know. The emotions do not know. The mind, however, is invited to step in and defend the emotions. So the mind says, well, it's obvious why I'm uncomfortable and unhappy. My neighbors have just borrowed the lawnmower. Or it was a bad day at the office. Or the children are noisier than usual. Or I've just been cheated at the, at the supermarket. These are the things with which we justify the annoyance. But the emotions themselves simply felt like being annoyed. So they were annoyed. And most persons asked why they do what they do, simply say because they feel like doing what they do. Now this feeling fullness, whatever it may be, constructive, destructive, or simply chaotic, must come from somewhere. 
And this feelingfulness comes from the internal resource of the individual when he is not thinking about resource. This is a proof of what the individual is when he is not trying to be anything. You see, when he tries very hard, he can put on a brief example of, of nobility that deceives even himself. <laughs> but the moment he relaxes and isn't trying to be good, he is simply himself. And too many persons, when they become simply themselves, are the victims of fear, pressure, tension, irritation, and things of this nature. They have to continually talk themselves and think themselves into a constructive state. This means that their better attitudes are deposited in a superficial structure and their weaknesses are atavistic. They go back to the very root of existence. So the person is in constant conflict between the impulse to do as he pleases and the intuition to do as he should. Pleasing self usually wins. If then man is merely moving from his own integration, or lack of it, into manifestation, and his in instinctive, unconditioned, unconsidered reactions to situations are negative, this means that the internal integration in himself is negative, that he has no solid positivity in his own character. How are we going to get it in there? We cannot actually impose a state of rationality from the outside. We cannot control the emotions with the mind. This ends finally only in a locking of energies in a death struggle. We are constantly fighting with the mind to be good, and we are fighting with the emotions to do as we please. Both of these energies become sort of irresistible forces, and in each case, the adversary remains an immovable object. So we are locked, and the result is tension. The result is a continual internal confusion and weakening, which in turn frequently leads to unfortunate habit addictions. But the mind is able to convey to the emotions certain valuable discoveries through the sensory perceptions uh, integrated by the mental agent, a continual flow of facts will move into the emotional substratum. The emotions have to be enriched by their own powers and by the power of the mind. The emotions cannot be fought, they must be unfolded or ennobled through understanding itself. So we are all seeking for understanding. For that which we understand will become the instinctive basis of our reaction. The more we understand, the more kindly our natural emotions will be. And the more completely we have disciplined ourselves, the more immediately we can react constructively and meaningfully to an emergency when it arises. So what we have to do is get behind the emotions to their very core and sublimate their procedures. We have to find richer emotional values. Now all the reading in the world will not do much in this sense. It may help us to strengthen imagination in a constructive way. It may give the mind additional rational instruments 
with which to persuade the emotions to a better level of conduct. But because emotional energy is of its own kind, it can react only to what might be termed actual experience. A thing to be known by the emotions must be vitally felt by the emotions. It must be an experience which touches the emotions as colorful experience. It cannot be an intellectualization of some abstraction. Nature has so constructed the essential emotions of man that they are capable of being matured into a sublime body of impulses. Impulses so essentially noble that by their own strength alone they could practically reform the world. But man has no more cultivated these than he has cultivated the areas of his mentation. He has permitted a large part of his emotional life to go untutored and uncultured. Thus, when he feels, he feels not from maturity, but from a lack of maturity. Lao Tse then tries to tell us what to do about this. How are we going to reach these emotions and give them a continually richer supply of emotional nutrition? The emotions reaching out into action must also sustain themselves to a measure by the testimonies of the sensory perceptions. The senses become the immediate instruments of experience. Therefore, we say again, and frequently we hear the statement, what I see, I believe. What actually touches us directly by sensory perception is far more important than report or opinion or speculation or theory. Lao Tse, as a small boy, was not uh, of the privileged class. His parents were peasants working on the estates of a great native prince. Therefore, he never went to school, but he found a method of self-instruction. And he found this by simply sitting on the side of a hill and looking out across the mountains, the valleys, and the plains of his mother earth, China. He saw a world unfolding, a world which he simply permitted to move in upon his own consciousness. It is very doubtful if Lao Tse could have had the immediate experience of this from a penthouse in New York because he would not see the world anymore. He would see it, really see the grotesque productions of human architectural misgenius. He would see something resembling that noble structure of the Guggenheim Museum, which sort of, sort of represents a, a psychic tailspin. Actually, however, Lao Tse, by looking out across a wide vista of nature itself, and relaxing his own objectivity, permitted nature to move in upon him and drench him internally. This drenching was a baptism of realities. He beheld nature's own magnificent program. He, he beheld the sublime evidence of the integration of all natural things. He looked out across this vista and could see no discord, no disharmony, no crash of discordant colors, no crash of discordant sounds. He saw everywhere a work of art. Every scene 
a painting. Every hour of the day, the moods changed, but every hour found the, mu the moods beautiful. He discovered the peculiar beauty of the dawn and of the sunset, and from this he became aware of the beauty of youth and of age. He saw everywhere that nature was trying to do it well, and had a wonderful gift for doing it well. He also recognized that by simply becoming sensitive to this, he found a source of courage, a source of security in his own nature. When he permitted nature to move in upon his own faculties, when he permitted these faculties to be receptive rather than continually objective and exploring, there came upon him this mystery of Tao, this mystery of the great peace which is reality. He found that the universe moved in upon him as a vast, benevolent, all-alive silence. He recognized also that this moving in upon him was an infinite strength. The more he experienced it, the more he realized that this magnificent flowing of life was irresistible, inevitable, that human beings could resist it if they wished, but in time it would wash away the dams that they built. For this motion, this tremendous reality, alone could win, alone could succeed. And that man's whole life was changed by his own mental conscious adjustment with this reality. If he wished to deny this reality, he could do so. And for a time he could wander alone in this veil of uncertainty, and finally drop into some shallow grave. If he wished to deny it, he could fight desperately to live without it. And finally, he could die for lack of it, even though he was in the midst of it all the time. He could also reach out and try to interpret it. He could say that this infinite life was cruel, that it was relentless, that it was destroying everything. And by thus affirming his own attitude, he was able to mentally rationalize it and prove it by the innumerable inconsistencies of human conduct. He could also, however, sense in this not only an infinite strength, but an infinite good. And through his meditation upon the nature of Tao as universal life, universal existence, he experienced not only its strength, but its beauty, not only its power, but its gentleness. Therefore, he pointed out that Tao was like water, uh, that like water, it was the soft thing that wore away everything that was hard. And as drops of water wear away mountains, so this power, which was never very obvious, which never seemed to dogmatically take over, which appeared always hesitant and reluctant, that this power was wearing away mountains, wearing away generations, and wearing away worlds. For this quiet, mysterious, subtle thing was by its own nature so inevitable that it had to win, and that in this winning was finally the hope of all living things, for it was the fact that this eternal must win that promises salvation to every creature. If this eternal does not win, then man lives in a sphere of accident alone. Sitting quietly, and allowing the infinite its proper admission 
through his senses, through his emotions, through his various psychic integrations, Lao Tzu simply became aware that he was forever in the midst of an infinite plan, infinitely good, infinitely wise, infinitely loving. In this realization, he gained a kind of insight, which has been termed the mystical experience. It was the individual becoming receptive to the full meaning of the universe in which he lived. This was not a meaning gained by the study of geology or biology or physics or mathematics, although all these could lead to that meaning. For well, the more we know about the universe, the more perfectly this meaning should be available to us. But beyond all science is the direct impact of the meaning itself. There are particular learnings that have to be gained by special skills. But there is a universal learning, which is a universal experience of man. And upon this universal learning, all meaning depends. And upon meaning, the use of all skills depend. And the individual is no more valuable to himself or his world than the degree of universal insight which he has attained. Lao Tzu therefore became one of the most learned men who ever lived. Learned in the wonderful mystery of all learning, namely the recognition that he lived forever in the presence of infinite security. That all these things that seemed doubtful were not doubtful at all. That the doubt is in man, not in the thing. That nature is not mysterious. It is man who has made it mysterious by veiling it with his own thoughts. Nature is not aggressive. It is man who has tried to become aggressive about nature. Nature is always the quiet winner. But at all times, Tao is inevitable. And man can come to this realization through a series of acceptances. Now it isn't possible for all people to accept the same type of instruction. That is why from the beginning of time there have been many schools and many paths that have led uh, to, uh, toward the light of reality. We cannot all sit on the sides of mountains and spend our lives gazing out upon the clouds and the waterfalls and the little ships moving up on the rivers. But each individual can, as Lao Tse pointed out, discover Tao inasmuch as Tao moves everything that does move. Tao is the correctness, the propriety of everything. The child can become aware of Tao if it takes music lessons. When it tries to span the octave and finds itself gradually brought under the discipline of music, the child can suddenly realize that music is Tao. Music is one way of discovering the total law of things. Music is also the power of man to become receptive to an inner enlightenment. For the great musician is the great soul. And the combination of the greatness of insight and the adequacy of skill constitute the musician. Thus heaven and earth produce man, as Lao Tzu says. And through the union of heaven and earth, man becomes the servant of Tao and the helper of his own kind. Uh, through art we can find Tao, through trades, the builder, the merchant. All of these persons are functioning within patterns that are in themselves Tao. The honorable, proper management of a business 
is only possible through the instinctive recognition of the way in which Tao manages all things. There are laws in everything. And wherever we are, we may become aware of those laws. And we also may become aware of the danger of breaking these laws. The awareness, when it breaks through into our objective consciousness, and we suddenly see the eternal working through some structure with which we are concerned, this seeing, this knowing, this awareness is a mystical experience. It is the discovery of the infinite in one of its infinite manifestations. And these infinite manifestations all bear witness, not to weakness, not to tension, not to stress, not to doubt, but to infinite strength, infinite good. Now, for daily purposes, how are we therefore going to try to build up this quotient of Tao experience within ourselves? Perhaps one of the simplest things we can do, as I suggested, is to apply a certain censorship upon conduct we must perhaps become a little more immediately aware when our conduct is inadequate. We must also begin the gentle task of realizing that we cannot overcome the tempest of our personalities, but we can remove energy from the tempest. The tempest must be energized in order to develop. A temper fit without energy is a dismal failure. In fact, it dies of boarding. Consequently, every negative process continues because we energize it. We can take the attitude that we will resist with grim determination and vast fortitude, the feeling that rises within us. But this constant resisting our own negation is a very neurotic procedure. It ends with a terrible frustration, because any individual who wants to do something and cannot do it is a prime subject for neurosis. But we can remove energy support. The moment we realize that what we are doing is contrary to our own instinct of what is right, what is good, what is proper for us, we can quietly remove energy. Now, how do we remove energy? Well, one thing is to reduce the total use of energy at that particular time. When we're getting ready to be nicely emotionally worked up about something, we can simply sit down very quietly and read a good book. This is devastating to the emotional situation because we fail to energize it. We can turn to some other activity which is going to drain off the energy. And instead of allowing ourselves to stew in this situation, we can turn to some interesting or productive endeavor. This takes a slight impulse of the will, but nothing to the degree of trying to fight the problem. The problem never needs to be fought. The problem dies if you don't keep it alive. The problem, therefore, is to find out how not to keep the negative alive. Gradually also, we can build certain ideal concepts within ourselves. One of these concepts is an increasing familiarity with our own natures. To most persons, their real selves is the one they have never known. And in this day of extreme objectivity, 
most people are suffering from lack of subjective existence on any level. Therefore, all thoughtful persons will be greatly benefited if they will allow themselves brief periods in which they simply cultivate quietude. There should be time in this day of labor-saving devices and moments in which television is not entirely captivating, in which the individual could prefer silence uh, to what he normally hears. And if we could actually suggest and recommend that every person would set aside five minutes a day simply to be quiet. And in this quietude, to simply move in a pattern of quiet beauty, visualizing the best experiences that they can out of their lives, thinking for a little while on the pleasures that their children have given them in the past, rather than perhaps the problem they may present today, thinking of the kindness that someone extended and which we like to forget when we wish to feel the most abused of all creatures. Simply uh, reminiscing in kindliness. Reminiscing in the realization of the Tao in other people. That through certain things that at the time looked rather unpleasant, we have made lessons valuable. That that thing we didn't get became the greatest blessing in our lives. And how we have outgrown a desire. So that today that desire no longer burdens us. And we realize that we have gone beyond that particular problem. Or this quiet thought of taking a person with whom we may have some misunderstanding. I'm trying to balance both good and ill. There is no reason mentally to whitewash, because everything has its faults. And we get a sort of sickly quality of optimism when we try to whitewash. We don't have to. As Lao Tzu himself tells us, all things are compositions. All things and all persons contain the helpful and less helpful qualities. But to dislike an individual, we must overlook that which is likable in him. To like a person, we must also sometimes overlook that which is not likable. But the wise person is the one who maintains a constructive attitude by being continually fair in the estimation of things. Uh, I heard a prominent leader of one of our world problem uh, countries not long ago mention uh, that if we began to like the qualities in people we have been trained to dislike, it would be a national disaster because we wouldn't be able to fight them anymore. Well, apparently war can be a national disaster also. I don't believe we're in grave danger of liking the people we do not like to that degree as yet that it will present an emergency. But I do believe that we can take a lot of the pain out of emergency and prevent many by being able to be quiet for a few minutes and think people through. To get certain insight. All right, Mr. Jones does have a quick temper. But Mr. Jones is a good, faithful husband and father. Mrs. Smith has a streak of jealousy in her nature, but she is also 
done a wonderful job bringing up her children. Mr. Brown um, hasn't a particularly pleasing personality, but years ago, under an emergency, he did a great deal of good. He's a little confused, nervous, and neurotic now, but after all, he fought for five years for his country and nearly died for the thing he believed. So we give him a little more patient understanding. Another individual has a jealous streak. We have to take this into consideration. But is this the whole person? Or is this something that they cannot adequately control either? And if this condition exists in them, what is good? What is there in them that is also benevolent? When we're mad at them, we can affirm decidedly that there is no good in them. But Lao Tzu says, let us not forget that in all things there is Tao. That the God of life is in the enemy and in the friend. As Akhenaten pointed out 3,400 years ago, the God in our enemy is just as divine as the God in our friend. Therefore, somewhere, this God in him must also be operating, perhaps in a limited way, perhaps with more confusion than in our own case. But it has to be there. And it is almost impossible to discover anyone in which there is not something that we can build upon as a positive experience, not necessarily just to justify them, but to justify Tao, to justify the universal fact. And as we begin to justify the universal fact in things, discover it, it begins to move in us also, reducing these tension problems and enabling us to mingle with people on a better and more constructive level of relationships. This does not mean that we must choose all peoples to be our particular friends, but we must choose all people to have certain rights in truth, in mind, in God, in reality. And we cannot allow prejudices and pressures to obscure this universal fact. If it does, we do not hurt the person we dislike nearly as much as we damage our own integration and lay for ourselves a foundation of future misery. The mystical experience, then, is a series of discoveries of the truth in things. Not merely an affirmation of these truths, but an experience of them. The child has this series of mystical experiences as it grows up in a world of wonders. Every day there is a new discovery. Every day there is a new revelation. But as we grow older, this power to discover and to recognize is dim. And we settle down into a universe that is very dull. Not because it is dull, but because we have lost the power to adventure. We settle down into prosaic and matter-of-fact things like making a living. We have lost the imagination that looks beyond and above and around and out into vastness which is more challenging and more remarkable and more tremendous than any of the small patterns which make up our lives. Actually, from the larger questing for value, we also gain the ability to handle these smaller patterns more effectively. If we have a certain natural optimism in ourselves, all of our affairs will go better we will find that other people are more kindly to us. Not long ago, I happened to talk to two people who went to trade in a certain market here in Los Angeles. 
one individual who was by nature a grouch, let's face it, uh, observed on this occasion that every time they went into that market, they were cheated. They got the poorest kind of goods that you can possibly imagine. That nobody paid any attention to them. The cashier almost always made a mistake adding up the bill. Everything was wrong. The other person who went to the same market was full of praise for it. Never had they get dealt with such a fine market. Uh, the various clerks always said good morning with a big grin. They always went around the back and got a little better group of tomatoes instead of the runts that customer number one was plagued with. But one look at the second customer and you knew why. The second customer was a very sweet-faced person with a natural, glowing, radiant friendliness. And in a few months, every clerk in the store was glad to see that person, call them by name, and went out of the way instinctively to do little kindnesses. So for this person, life in the supermarket was a pleasure. But for the other one who went in expecting to be cheated, it was a dismal misery. And in our way of life today, we get more and more of this attitude that we expect to be cheated. We expect to be deceived. We expect to be exploited. Well, maybe we will be in some instances. But uh, brave men die but once. And cowards die a thousand times. A well-intentioned person may be cheated occasionally. But the sour-faced one waiting to be cheated will be cheated every day of their lives. And will gradually live in a world that is so obnoxious that there is nothing left worth living for. It is far better to be wrong, to be wrong optimistically than pessimistically. It is far better to have a hope in value and be deceived than to take an attitude that everything is wrong and end up with acidosis. The actual loss can be reclaimed with industry, but the loss of faith in life with its attendant physical problems cannot be restored by a little further industry. It may require a long process of therapy or a very long, difficult life to wash out this peculiar tendency to negation that once taking over will destroy all of the essential value of life. So the mystical attitude is not just simply the heavens unfolding and God revealing himself with his angels. The mystical attitude is this unfolding from within of the sense that we live in a total reality. And that from this total reality we can continue to build anything that is necessary at any time. We can call upon it in any emergency. It will perhaps not actually lengthen life, but it will lengthen the joy of life. And in many instances it will add years, because it will remove the tension which kills. It may not solve every problem, but it will make the individual better able to adjust to those problems that cannot quickly be solved. It will not make us perhaps all wise, some will feel we are too gullible. But it is, I think, a little better to be slightly gullible than it is to be totally critical. With, with however, Tao, remember, we are not on the deep end of optimism. Tao does not tell us that other people have no faults. Tao does not say that man will not cheat man. Tao does not say that we will not be deceived or injured by others. 
thou makes no such claim. But it also points out that the individual who integrates his own life gains not only an understanding of the mystery of the divine presence, but becomes naturally able to judge the probabilities of the conduct of other persons. He is sensible, not merely optimistic. He is not expecting miracles. He is not prepared to place temptation in the way of others. But he is trying constantly to build upon the good, not only in others, but in himself. And his reward is better adjustment and better ability to control situations. In a world crisis such as we are in, this inner strength gives us the ability to perform whatever actions are natural and suitable with a minimum of regret and a maximum of courage. Uh, these attitudes within us help us to support such programs as are actually right and will also give us the courage not to support programs which are actually wrong. We will then have a sense of freedom uh, from dependency upon community existence for total existence ourselves. Each of us has a taproot, and this taproot goes down to the source of life. Other roots can be cut off and the plant will live, but if the taproot is severed, it will probably die. The taproot of every human being leads down to Tao, leads down to universal life, and that is the one root that must be kept. That is the one root uh, which the tree sends forth. In the Arabic fables you hear about the palm tree that will send down its taproot 60 feet into the sand for water. It must have this water. Today man is striving to get his taproot deep enough into the dark earth of mystery so that finally he will find the root in the waters of life, that in the mystery of eternal life is his own existence. This getting the taproot is very important to man today. All other affairs of life may come and go, may be added to or subtracted from, but the secure person in an emergency is the one who has this taproot down deep enough so that it is securing its life essence from the universal life supply. And it can be done. And it can be done by quietude toward the pressures of action. If we know in our own hearts that we are over-ambitious, over-aggressive, that there is something inside that is not doing what it is doing from right motive, but from the desire to gratify some personal feeling, then we can be still and we can say to ourselves, I really know and I always have known that what I am doing, I am doing because I want to do, because it gratifies me and not because it is essentially right. And in that moment, keep quiet. And in that quietude, let right reveal itself. Let right also bestow its own courage. And if there is any contemplation at all accompanying this, let us remember that if we cling to that which is right, our families, our homes, our occupations, our health will all be improved. If we cling only to that which we want and which conscience tells us actually is not right, but merely gratification, we must pay for this because we have broken the law. We have broken the law 
which Lao Tse calls this law of gracious living, this law of doing things beautifully and well because it is the nature of life to do things beautifully and well. And it is the privilege of man to labor with heaven for the fulfillment of all good things. This private decision, quietly made, in every moment of stress or uncertainty, this private decision made in every determination of our own character will gradually cause us to become inwardly aware that the light in us wants to live beautifully. When we understand that, we will get our great joy from being true to life rather than merely gratifying personal desire. We will also discover then that our emotions and our thoughts are magnificent instruments for the fulfillment of life purpose and not merely little slaves to the selfish and ambitious attitudes of unenlightened emotion and thought. So we gradually enrich this experience of internal. And when we finally do make this binding link with Tao, we have made this contact because we have fulfilled Tao in ourselves. And when we become like Tao, then we know the law. We become what we are like. And we are united with that which we are like. If we are like death, we shall be united to death. If we are like eternal life, we shall be united to eternal life and shall experience its living fact. These experiences arising in character are of the greatest assistance to us in facing the problems of daily living. That's it.